Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Read Aloud Fun. Today you are being read to by Deputy U.S. Marshal Way Myers. So that should give you a little bit of a clue of what we're reading about today. Today is not going to be a fictional story. Today is going to be a non-fictional story. It means it is about a real personal event. In this case, we are reading about a real person and real event. So while we're waiting on some more folks to join, one thing we can do is what get you out a blank sheet of paper. It could be notebook paper. I just happen to have a copy of paper. And when you think about the old West, what comes to your mind? Who's there? What does the landscape look like? What are the people to doing? What are they dressed like? Who are the people there? You can take a few moments while we're waiting and draw a picture of what you believe the Old West looked like. That includes the people, the buildings, whatever you think was there. Okay? While you are doing your drawing, I'm going to show you a picture. This is Bass Reeves, and this is the gentleman that we will be reading about today. He was the first African-American U.S. Deputy Marshal west of the Mississippi. Uh, he is not well known in our history books, but he should, okay? So we're gonna read a story about Bass Reeves. So let's get into it. And the story itself is called, Bad News for Outlaws, The Remarkable Life of Bass Reeves, Deputy U.S. Marshal. And this book is written by Von Day Nelson and is illustrated by R. Gregory Christie. And just, you know, to remember that even nonfiction books can have illustrated pictures. Don't necessarily have to be photographs. Okay. So let's learn about Mr. Reeves. Showdown, Indian Territory, 1884. Jim Webb's luck was running muddy when Bass Reeves rode into town. Webb had stayed one jump ahead of the lawman for two years. He wasn't about to be caught now. Packing both rifle and revolver, the desperado leaped out of a window of Bywater store. He made a break for his horse, but Reeves cut him off. Bass hollered from the saddle of his stallion, warning Webb to give up. The outlaw bolted. Bass shook his head. He hated bloodshed, but Webb might need a killing. As a deputy U.S. Marshal, it was Bass's job to bring Webb in, alive or dead. Bass had put Webb behind bars before, but the outlaw was back on the run. That would end today. Webb couldn't outrun a horse, and he knew he he um, he knew he'd hang for sure this time. In a last ditch effort to escape, Webb stopped in his tracks, turned, and let loose with his rifle. Oops, sorry about that. Webb's first shot grazed Bass's saddle horn. His second shot cut a button from the lawman's coat. Webb's third tore the reins right out of Bass's hands. Bass ducked his head, dove off his horse, and rolled to his feet just, a fourth, just as the fourth bullet clipped the brim of his hat brim. So, how close that came. That was Jim Webb's last shot ever. Marshall Reeves fired two rounds from his Winchester rifle, and the outlaw was done for. As he lay dying, Webb told Bass, you are a brave, brave man. I have killed 11, and I expected to make you the 12th. 
Webb gave Bass his revolver out of respect. Bass buried Webb's body and turned in the outlaw's boots and gun as his proof he'd gotten his man. Being a peace officer in Indian territory was rough and dangerous. The area swarmed with horse thieves, train robbers, cattle rustlers, and gunslingers. Bandits, swindlers, and murders drive. Travelers sometimes disappeared, never to be heard from again. A lawman's career could be short and end bloody. So Bass Reeves had a big job, and it, and it suited him right down to the ground. Everything about him was big. Bass stood a head taller than most men of his time. He had broad shoulders and huge hands. Bass was so strong, he single-handedly pulled a steer out of mud up to its neck while a bunch of slack-jawed cowpokes stood speechless. Bass sported a large bushy mustache and wore a wide-brimmed black hat. He rode tall, powerful horses. But the biggest thing about Bass was his character. He had dedication to duty for few men to do that few men could match. He didn't have a speck of fear in him. He was as honest as the day is long. And there he is, pulling the cow out. Slave days, 18, excuse me, the 18, 40s to the 1860s. Bass spent most of his early years as a slave in Texas. Even as a younger, even as a youngster, his star shone bright. Bass was sharp, witted, and good, good natured. People liked his pluck. He had a special way with animals, especially horses. Bass tended livestock and fetched water from the field hand, for the field hands. While he worked, Bass sang. He sang about pistols and rifles and knives. <clears throat> Excuse me. He sung of bandits and killers and thieves. His mother feared her boy might go bad. She couldn't have been more wrong. Bass took to guns like a bear to honey, but he always handled them with respect. He grew up smart and decent and had nothing but right in his heart. His owner, Colonel George Reeves, took Bass honey and ended him in shooting contests. He liked showing Bass off. Excuse me. Oh, I can't see that. Bass impressed his owner so much the colonel took him along when he went to fight in the Civil War. But one night, something happened that changed everything for Bass. Folks say the two men argued during a card game, and Bass struck his owner. For a slave, this meant certain death. Bass made tracks for Indian territory. So he had to run away. Because even though his owner loved, liked him, striking him, was he wasn't going to let that go. Freedom and family, late 1860s to 1874. Only Native Americans were supposed to live in Indian territory, but some Indians accepted Blacks. Bass lived with the tribes, learned their languages, and perfected his marksmanship as he roamed the frontier. Bass felt a freedom he'd never known. Still, as a runaway slave, Bass had to keep on the dodge. Finally, the Civil War ended and the slaves were freed. It was, it was safe for Bass to settle down. He bought a spread in Arkansas just outside of Indian Territory and married a pretty woman named Jenny. True to the song of his life, Bass had a big family. He and Jenny and their 11 children worked the land and raised hardy livestock. Bass' life was good, but times were hard for folks in Indian Territory. The vastness of the wild country offered countless places for bad men to hide. 
The territory became a haven for the West's most notorious outlaws. Settlers in Indian territory had had enough. Even though most were squatters who had put down stakes illegally, they still wanted protection. Like most former slaves, Bass could not read, but this didn't stop him from doing his job. Before going after wanted men, he had the arrest warrants from Judge Parker read to him. Bass listened carefully and memorized the shapes of the letters for each name he heard. He memorized the charges against each person. He hit the trail. Even when he got 30 warrants at one time, Bass always brought in the right outlaws. Bass could out man. Bass could be out, excuse me, Bass could be out manhunting for weeks. He slept on the ground under the stars and worked in bitter cold and sweltering heat. Like other deputy marshals, Bass traveled with a chuck wagon, a cook, a guard, and at least one posse man and tumbleweed wagon to transport captives. Many lawmen of the time weren't much better than the hard cases they arrested, but Bass was as right as rain. From the boot to the heels up, he couldn't be bribed, and he shot only as a last resort, even when George Parker said, bring in alive or dead. Some outlaws, like Jim Webb, forced gunplay. Whatever Bass could, he found another way. So he didn't like having to kill the outlaw. He always tried to bring him in alive instead of dead. Bass took many a bad man by surprise through the use of disguises. Okay, so he has some skills. One day, he posed as a cowboy. Another, he'd be a tramp, a gunslinger, or an outlaw. Even horses played a part in his disguises. Like many U.S. Marshals, Bass rode some of the finest. Most times, he fought at handsome sorrel. Bass rode proud in the saddle. There was no mistake in his silhouette. But prize horse flesh could be a dead giveaway that rider that the rider was a lawman. Bass always kept some rough stock and rode lazy while undercover. So he would pretend to be one of them in order to catch them if he had to. Smart man. He planned every capture carefully. When Bass caught wind that two outlaw brothers were holed up at their mother's cabin, he rounded up a posse and made a camp some distance away. Bass knocked the heels from a pair of worn boots and shot three holes in a floppy old hat. He hid his badge, handcuffs, and pistols under trail-worn clothes, then started walking along to the hideout. It was a long walk, 28 miles. Bass wanted to be sure that if the brother spotted him, they wouldn't suspect he was a law. When the outlaw's mother answered the door, Bass said he was tuckered out and hungry. Showing the woman the bullet holes in his hat, he claimed a posse was after him. She took Bass in, fed him some vittles, and even let slip that her boys were on the lamb. When the two arrived, they agreed to partner up with Bass, and after sharing some laughs, everyone went to sleep. Everyone except Bass. At sunup, the brothers awoke in handcuffs. They were dumbstruck, but their mom was fit to be tied. As Bass led her sons away, she followed for three miles, calling him every bad name she knew. So they had let the lawman in. He spent the night, and when they woke up, he had them in cuffs. And their mother was not happy. On a different warrant, warrant, Bass pretended to be a farmer. He rented some scrawny oxen. Excuse me. And 
run, run down wagon. Bass drove the rig to the hideout of the man he was tracking. He ran over a stump on purpose and got a wheel cart. The outlaws came out to help. They wanted to get him away from their hideout. Just as the criminals freed up the wagon, Bass jerked his coat. Seeing, seeing it was Deputy U.S. Marshal Bass Reeves, all four outlaws threw up their hands. So once they realized who it was, it was like, mm, no need. He got us. We might as well surrender. Bass body and wagon loads of criminals, as many as 17 prisoners at a time. Being a chuck Church going man, Bass reckoned he could do more than put bad men behind bars. In the evenings after supper, he talked to the outlaws about the Bible and about doing right. Getting through to them was like trying to find hair on a frog, but Bass kept trying. Now and then, captured outlaws tried to get the better of the marshal, but Bass was tough as tough and unflappable, excuse me. One day while he napped, a skunk moseyed into camp and stopped next to Bass. Uh-oh. Captain's chain to the tumbleweed wagon threw stones at the skunk, hoping it would spray <laughs> it stank on the lawman. But when Bass awakened, he didn't flinch. He reached out and gently Pet, petted the skunk. The brave man. I'm not petting no skunk. I'm sorry. Word spread that Bass was a square shooter, but a hard man. Outlaws learned that when Marshall Reeves had your warrant, you was good as God, unless you hightailed it out of the territory. One outlaw named Hullaby Sammy did just that, with Bass on his heels. Sammy mounted a swift black charger that flat out ran the marshal song, but Bass was patient. He would cross paths with Sammy on another day, and Bass would get his man. So sometimes when they knew it was Bass coming from, they just run. Even the infamous bandit queen, Belle Starr, admired Bass. Belle was about as far from tender as boot leather. She trifled with the likes of Jesse James and didn't cotton to lawmen. But when she heard Bass had her warrant, she turned herself in for the first and only time in her long, lawless career. She didn't even want to go up against Bass Reeves. She said, forget it. I'll turn myself in. Bass was respected and he was hated. Some whites didn't like the notion of a black man with a badge. Desperado simply wanted Bass off their trails. Bass had to be on the lookout day and night for bad men who were out to drive goat him. But danger was a small matter for this lawman. Duty was his guide. Right and wrong were clear and simple. One day on the prairie, Bass came across an angry mob lynching a man. Without a word, Bass cut down the man and put him on the back of his sword. This was near as risky as a grasshopper landing on an ant hill, but the mob just watched in awe as he rolled off. They recognized Marshal Reeves and dared not interfere. So they knew who he was, and they didn't even try to interfere with what he had done. Bass's devotion to duty was legendary. His sense of justice was never more tested than by his son, Benjamin. One awful day, Benjamin killed his own wife after she'd been untrue. Bass was so well liked, no one wanted to arrest his son. For two days, the warrant lay on the desk of the marshal in Muskie. When Bass returned to the jail with prisoners, he got the sad news. It was painful, but he did what only Bass Reeves would do. He arrested his own son and turned him over to the court. 
Although he was sentenced to life, Bass's son was a model prisoner and was pardoned after just after serving just 10 years. So because Bass believed in his duties, even when his son had done wrong, the other deputies, no one would arrest him. Bass came back into town, found out what his son had done, and he arrested him. He did what he was supposed to do. It wasn't easy for him, but he did it. Oklahoma Statehood, November 16, 1907. Bass Reed's life as a deputy U.S. Marshal ended the day Oklahoma became a state and Indian Territory ceased to exist. State and local lawmen took over the federal marshal's duties. Bass Reed served as deputy U.S. Marshal in Indian Territory for 32 years, longer than any other. In fact, he was the only deputy who started with Judge Parker and stayed clear through statehood. He arrested he arrested more than 3,000 men and women, blacks, whites, and Indians. Many were desperate outlaws who knew Bass, rode for Parker, and figured they had nothing to lose by fighting to the death. Bass had many close calls, but was never wounded. Remarkably, he killed only 14 men in the line of duty. Now the finest deputy U.S. Marshal of his time was out of a job. Bass bought Gideon put out the pasture. He hired on with the police force in Muskie, Oklahoma. Bass was nearly 70 years old and walking with the cane, but he still put the fear of God into lawbreakers. During his two years on the force, not a single crime occurred in his patrol area. So even in his 70s, walking on a cane, they knew Bass was in control of that territory. He had no crimes. They were still afraid of him. One day, one fall day, Bass, left, Bass Reeves left work feeling ill. Two months later, on January 12, 1910, he died of a kidney ailment called Bright's disease. Hundreds of people, blacks, whites, and Indians attended his burial. A fellow lawman, Bud Ledbetter, Carl Bass, one of the bravest men this country has ever known. And one white homesteader said Bass was the most feared deputy U.S. Marshal that was ever heard of. Over the years, the name Bass Reeves faded like one of those heroes they call unsung. But his story has folks talking again, talking about the big man who helped bring peace to a big country. Deputy U.S. Marshal Bass Reeves, a true champion of the American West. And that was the story. Bad News for Outlaws, The Remarkable Life of Bass Reeves, Deputy U.S. Marshal. Now, one... Um, question that you could ask what did Will give Bass before he died? What were some of the dangers in the Indian Territory? What did Bass like to sing about as a boy? Terrified his mother. According to the story, what did Bass and Colonel Reeves argue about? Why did Bass run away? What event gave Bass his freedom? How was Bass Reeves well suited for the job of deputy marshal? How did Bass use creative ways to catch criminals? All of these are some thinking points that you can uh, go over with your child or your student. And uh, one more last thing that you could do before I end. If you are in the classroom, you could have your students fold their paper so that it makes four uh, neat squares. And in each square, so one square they could write, uh, share a personal connection to the story. 
So some way that they connected to the story, um, then they could write one question that they have about the story. It might be something else that they want to um, research further, then tell one thing that surprised them about the story, and then they could draw a picture of an important event or moment from the book. And that is it for today. We will be back on Saturday at 2 o'clock. Until then, see you, see you later.